What's up everyone? Today we're going to be reacting live to a video that just came out from a channel called Distraction Makers, one that's been making the waves on my feed and growing in popularity just due to the gaming discussions that they have, especially around board games and Magic the Gathering. It's two folks just discussing with each other uh, from a newer developer and an experienced AAA developer talking about game design. And, and there's been a lot of discussions around uh, generally card games and Magic the Gathering recently, and it's been popping off a lot. And they just released this video talking about the hidden cost of tutor spells. Now, I want to hear what they have to say about tutors, which is a very divisive topic in magic. Eat candy every day, <laughs> right? You're like, I just want to only eat chocolate ice cream. Right. <gasps> Distraction makers. All right. Where do you stand on tutors? Generally, like just generally brief, brief. Yeah. Where do you stand on tutors? They're bad. Okay. You think they're bad? So I think they're not only bad cards to play, like bad in terms of like, they're just bad cards that don't do anything. Uh, this is a very 60 card tournament player perspective. Okay. Uh, the old standard. So I, I think that's important. Okay. So, you know, before we start talking about tutors in EDH and how, Generally, you know how you know the design, the designers themselves of EDH and a lot of folks don't agree that tutors should be in it because in a hundred card format, singleton format, there's a lot of discussion around you know lack of consistency and that's what creates the magic of the game. But in a constructed environment, that discussion's a little different. Standard format, yeah, for yeah. old grumps. Right, I am right. a boomer. Right. I'm a magic boomer, uh, and it makes me look at tutors through the lens of. They are actually suboptimal, which is funny because we're talking about how suboptimal they are, they are actually very optimal in commander. In commander, yeah. I have an anecdote. Yes. This is my Tiamat deck. You know how much I love anecdotal evidence. Yeah. <laughs> this is how I know we're right because right. it's something I have personally experienced, and therefore <laughs> it must be that's true. Absolute. You're right because it is. One thing I do want to point out is, is, is if you watch like video to video, they'll change. You see how there's like stuff on the middle of their desk. I left this small touch where they'll like change what's on that desk based on the discussion at hand. I, I love it. Watch, watch their videos. It's great. It's fact that you have experienced it. Yes. So this is my Tiamat deck. This is the evidence. Yes. Tiamat. You know what Tiamat does? I do. Yeah. But Tiamat, tell, tell the listeners at home. <laughs> when Tiamat enters the battlefield, if you cast it, Search your library for up to five dragon cards not named Tiamat that each have different names. Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. Pretty good. Right. Dragon tutor. Plus seven. It's a seven tutor. But I tutor for five cards, right? Right. Do you know how each commander game plays with Tiamat? Tell me. The same. I've never played against this commander. <laughs> Pretty much the exact same. I have right. maybe 15... 20 dragons in that deck right as creatures right i really yeah. don't need to have that many creatures because i know at seven mana i'm going to get whatever creatures i want yeah that's going to suit the field Pretty in its current state right? right that's what tutors do tutors is a card that represents whatever card i need in this exact moment that's what this card is right now it costs a little bit extra because of whatever the tutor cost is and, and I think this is a very interesting point to note, like determinism, like like deterministic gameplay is, I think, where tutors start seeing that downfall, like in constructed 60 card, like one v one play being having like a deterministic game plan is very crucial for both players. You as the player, knowing that you have the consistency to enact the card spells and lines of play that you have and the sequencing, and then your opponent, it's important for them as well so that they know how to interact, when to hold up mana and do what. And this is where car is stuff like spicy one ofs and two ofs can really kind of change the pace of play. But in commander stuff like I, I love what he's doing here talking about the determinism of this where he's only playing like 20 creatures and all of them are dragons so he knows exactly the dragons he needs in that specific game state to make that work so i think this is where tutors are flawed in edh and how you don't want that deterministic factor in a game like that whereas in constructed they're really powerful they're uh they're i wouldn't say necessary but a relatively balanced concept but in implementation they may not be as balanced so that's a whole other discussion but that's what this is i think there's many many players that probably love tutors if i were to guess and in fact insist Me. that you have to have tutors in a lot of your decks because yeah it is very optimal in a singleton format like what the uh, commander is mm -hmm. but 
the benefit of Commander and why it's touted as a casual format and why I think it probably should still remain a casual format is should. because it is singleton with 100 cards. And suddenly, if you have, let's say, 10 tutors, now you actually have a 90-card deck. Right. In a way. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about, like, we're looking at, like, how one might optimize the fun out of Commander. And this... I lo- okay, that statement right there. Tutors optimizing the fun out of... You know, that's not what he exactly said, but I, I guess that's where this discussion might be going. I think, okay, so what they said about, you know, having X amount of tutors, you're essentially playing like a 90 card deck. I think that's like genuinely correct because like the tutors that we have in the EDH format are so like they're like one mystical tutor being one of them, like mystical tutor. A lot of times, you know, you have like a draw card, just, you know, putting it on top, you mystical tutor at end step and then you put the card on top and you're able to draw it like it's so deterministic. It it essentially like mystical tutor always is like a couple cards in your deck. Like it's either going to be the counter spell or it's going to be the first spell in your chain of storm spells to really win. Like stuff like that is so powerful. I mean, heck in vintage, you see why cards like tinker are um, kind of limited to what they are. Like they're just so powerful for what they do because they are deterministically going to be one or two artifacts that you're going to be searching for most of the time that are going to lead you to a chain. So I think creating determinism, as I mentioned, this is, is a definitely pattern a that I see emerge in a lot of, even in, in myself and making commander decks is that um, you're, you're basically uh, like trying to hedge against the fact that you're making a 100 card deck that can only have one copy of each card. You'll play a lot of redundancies. You'll play uh, different abilities that help you uh, sift through your deck much faster than you should. Things like Cascade. I have a dredge deck that is a lot of fun, but this is basically what it's doing. Right. Is that I'm dredging and I'm getting through my deck and I'm trying to get cards into my graveyard. And you know, I'm going to... Now, game now plan there that is, is a bit of variance every there game because I'm not... I don't know exactly what's going to end up in my graveyard, and that changes per game. But I feel like it it lands somewhere in the middle there of having some amount of variance each time I play it, but also I'm able to execute my plan more than not. As right. with any card game. Now, when you exactly. start moving into tutor space, now you're getting into, okay, well, right, this, this card represents any card in my deck that I need at this particular moment. I think what we should try to do here is look at the design philosophy behind a tutor why like it's so interesting because i don't think that they were particularly they they weren't impactful at all in 60 card magic right a tutor like basically tutors were never played in tournament magic very very Uh, maybe back then even in combo decks you had ways to get through your deck and draw what you needed to get to because you could play four copies of a card uh and theoretically you four ancestral throughout the, the course of the game and so decks can be made in a way where they execute the thing they're supposed to execute yeah. you can you can design a deck that is supposed to do a thing and it will do that thing more often than it won't right now when you look at commander w- the only reason why you would have a deck that is 100 cards and you only get one copy of each of them is so that you're the game is wildly different each time that you play it your Ideally. deck operates in a bunch of different to the ways fundamentals of EDH. And you're not sure which deck you're actually playing with until you're halfway through the game and you're like oh that's what this deck is this time you know <clears throat> and when you you build in a way this is especially true one of my favorite types of edh decks are like secret commander decks where like the commander isn't out front you essentially play this like five color commander but then you build like a three color commander and the actual legendary commander is like hidden in the deck that's like one of my favorite types of decks try building it just just build a commander like use the commander as a five color and just you can do anything with it but then actually have like a one cost card that's like your true seeker commander and that's the card you get out and you go off with it's a cool design but uh yeah different different every time but like it's kind of like a seeker thing that is trying to subvert the nature of the format in putting putting in tutors things that sift through the deck as quickly as possible uh you're effectively playing just a worse version of 60 card magic uh and when we look at the way that uh this this is great in line with all the cdh drama that's been going on recently why isn't cdh just a 1v1 format if people don't like table politics and lying and bluffing but i um cedh decks function uh they function in this way it's it literally it's just looking very similar to what a lot of 60 card combo decks i promise like. you i haven't watched because this video in, you know when you have three other people that you need to kill that have 40 life each in order to win the game the best way to do that is just to play something that wins the game a different way 
either being able to kill them all immediately or just play fast as Oracle and you can just deck yourself and then you just win, right? You have like a card that says I win the game. Right. <clears throat> so these decks all get built in this way that you're effectively playing a deck that has so many copies of whatever card you need because you're playing a bunch of tutor spells. You're basically play, playing a bunch of fast mana, you're playing a bunch of counter spells, and you're playing a few combo pieces and then yeah. tutors to get you there. Because magic was based around these initial uh, variables, right? that's what all cards are meant to be designed around, right? You have 20 life. Ideally, you have a 60-card deck. Ideally. Um, and now, initially, they didn't have limitations to how many Battle cards you have, players shortly afterwards, right they added a four-card four, four card limitation. And that's, that's it. Those are the limits, right? Because I think that they decided that is the ideal amount of variance yeah. um, to where you can still pull off the strategies that you want to pull off in a way, but it is not a guarantee of how you pull them off or how efficiently you pull them off. Yes. I think that the more opportunities you give players to optimize uh, their uh, variance in a way is going to make the games feel more and more the same. And that's why I yes. bring up my Tiamat deck. Because every game I play Tiamat is practically the same. It's yeah. not that my opening hand is a little bit different. You know, whether I get mana rocks, how fast I ramp, etc. I don't know. But the minute I get seven mana... And this is what I always thought was, like, weird about CDH decks, right? Like, they, how they have, like, primers. And, like, you can literally, like, get a whole guide to an ED, whereas like any other casual ED deck, you just play a commander and you can just build around it and like generally yeah it'll play differently based on the spells you draw what your opponent's doing to you and then like oh i never knew that these cards interacted this way whereas cdh is like yeah your opponent's gonna play orcish bowmasters here they're gonna counter this spell here so you gotta have this here you gotta draw here you gotta hold this back and it, like all this type of stuff and i always thought it was like a really weird way to play the format in a four four player format but I don't know. I guess like that's what ultimately CDH players want. Like they just want EDH, but like everyone's winning. But then it's also kind of dumb because it's deterministic, right? Like games play out generally the same, but I guess people like that. I don't, I don't know. Why aren't you just go play some, go play some constructed or something. I, I, know, I, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, now the game is still fun in a way because of how you, you know, your brain gets to think of how I'm going to problem solve all this stuff. But yeah. I know generally what I'm going to get probably and what's going to happen. And when you look at other games that do this, you can see a lot of other card games that go and do the same exact thing, and they play very similarly. If you look, Yu-Gi-Oh! I think is the worst example of this, um, in that Yu-Gi-Oh! is very, very structured, in that if you have a search card, it is you search for this exact named card. Right. And you get that exact named card. Sure. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And they do that in order to try and shape the meta, and, you know, they yeah. do that. Yeah, it's a very Japanese There's a lot of control design, over what is possible right like, like an eastern card game versus like a western a, card game player perspective is like yeah i guess i'm just going through the motions right like <laughs> exactly and <laughs> this it's is what the but, designer wants me to do but it's so I guess very very similar because yeah. of how the designer has, has structured it right digimon has a middle ground where they've decided they don't have exact tutors i don't think okay. at this point it's been a while since i've been in it but okay. they have where you look at the top five cards of your deck maybe mm -hmm. top 10 cards and if there's something with this exact name or this exact name or this exact name, <laughs> then you add it into your hand. So, they so this is this is like um, I'm just pointing out like so for the One Piece TCG, they have this as well. And I'm just speaking as someone who's who's played that, not Digimon. Uh, they call these just like searchers. Um, and this is this is what they call searchers. There aren't necessarily like hard tutors in the game. There, there are it's like one or two, but they're very niche. They get like relatively bad cards and they're not really played. So searchers are like you need that you generally cost one and it's like each color has them and like archetypes are kind of defined by if they have a searcher or not. Um, most archetypes do and they're playable if they do because they allow you to just have these cards that are really weak and aren't really dead. They allow you to look through the top five cards of your deck top three look for a certain card of a type and then you put it in your hand. So that kind of determines the playability of certain archetypes at least in the one piece TCG if you have a searcher big bonus it's probably just going to be good because then you just need payoffs from there um but searchers are actually pretty big. Like i didn't know digimon had them as, yeah, as well is what, yeah that that type of thing would be called like you 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 look at the top cards you pick one or if it's there you get it kind of like not, impulse get it. Uh, Magic. right okay. and that's one way of trying to ease the optimization of just saying oh you just get that card right. but it's still essentially basically the, the designer saying okay yeah. we want you to play this deck that we've made you Right. right? Yeah. So here's the things to play that deck that we made. It was really interesting to see this, like, 
uh, what I feel like is a misunderstanding of like what variance is intended, like like why you want it, right? Yeah. It's it's sort of this. What it feels like for to me is this uh, design perspective that you're gonna just let variance be there, right? For people that don't want to do this specific thing that you want them to do, right? It's almost like I, I liken designing card games to to designing Lego a lot in that. Okay, That's um, interesting. If you design a very specific lego brick it's not useful for a lot of stuff it basically is like a windshield to a car it can be used as a windshield maybe as a window but probably just as a windshield right Mm -hmm. versus if you design you know the basic bricks they can be put together in many different ways to create all kinds of different things right you're you're allowing for players creativity to take over until they optimize the fun out of it but (laughs) if that's what they want to do but it's an optimal way to make a lego brick house um but yeah i think that um I think it's the accessibility of the optimization that is the problem, at least in in games like Commander, right? Where when you have a rotation or where it's just not as viable because of how the game has been... I mean, how much does Demonic Tutor cost? Demonic Tutor costs two? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. So it's two extra mana. has to be black. Two extra black mana to to play any card card. that you want. Right. That's not a great... That's like a... That's a trade-off. That right. is a realistic. It's an interesting way to think about format. cards. Like tutors are like an extra tax. It's very easy to get that too. Well, in a, in a standard format, it's interesting because you're being punished much more for doing this. Right. right. When it's one on one, and you spent your turn pet playing a tutor spell. Let's say you did. Like let's say turn two, you played demonic tutor. Uh, you've done nothing to advance the board state. Yeah. You've done nothing to move yourself Fair. closer to winning the game, which is why tutors don't get played in 60-card formats, because uh, your opponent is busy killing you while you're busy. Uh, okay, so in a general sense, yes, but that's because they're designed that way. There's a reason if you're playing the timeless format on Arena, Demonic Tutor is restricted. There's a big reason for that, because every black deck would be playing, and you'd just be playing. You'd just be tutoring for like the optimal card, like in, in hyper in hyper fixed formats where you have rituals, you have a lot of ways to advance your board state with cheating mana. This is not really a relevant discussion because you can just get out the cards you tutor for and the cards you tutor for are generally going to be extremely game winningly powerful. So you don't need to advance your board state. You just kind of win the game next turn. So that's what tutors present. But like in lower power formats pioneer standard whatever yeah they don't really get played or they get played in specific niche scenarios um and that and they're like archetype defining but they're very fixed in a certain way they'll only grab like a land they'll only grab a sorcery they'll only grab something out of your sideboard um things like that is he trying to find something right like it doesn't uh it, it's it's uh, often these cards are called do nothings right it's just that like it, it, the, Do nothing the is optimization a little extreme. level in a 60 card format doesn't allow for that to function but when everybody's playing with a 100 card singleton deck suddenly these tutors become more of a thing right uh and it's it really is i don't know it, it's weird because I, I i do think looking at it through the lens of are these decks that are fully optimized in this way just bad versions of 60 card decks it's not yes. the player's fault for doing this and so i don't want to say I don't want to make this seem as if, like, we're yes, talking about are. this and, and uh, how dare players do this or players have to make different decks in this way. It's like, of course you're going to do this <laughs> if that's going to be what's most optimal. Um, I think, I don't know, the thing to consider is that, like, any game that exists, this is what players will always do. It's sort of like if you could eat candy every day, <laughs> right? You're like, I just want to only eat chocolate ice cream. Right. Box. And I will. And someone's hearing that through a window right yeah through through a, a, a what is it a two-way mirror is that what they're called oh yeah right yeah. someone's on the other side with a clipboard and they're going and they, they want they want chocolate they ice cream give them every day give them chocolate ice cream give every them day. the chocolate ice <laughs> so i think like as we end this video i think it's important to understand that tutors define every single powerful format in in magic right now um high power format uh there are a lot of tutors in pioneer that are very low-key Standard isn't as played. I would not consider standard a high power format, but formats like EDH, Legacy, Vintage, Modern, heck, even Popper are all defined by tutors, right? There are many ways to tutor in those games, in those formats. And if there are, if there aren't, if they aren't played, they're very restricted. I just want to point out as we end this video that fetch lands are tutors. 
fetch lands are played everywhere. So I think they might be missing this whole point by only construing it to the standard style of play. Whereas in high power formats, fetch lands are literally land tutors. They provide you perfect mana. And there, there's a reason why fetch lands are the most powerful cycle of cards that exist in magic right now. Hands down. They are format defining. There's a whole reason why a timeless is popular. And even with the the kind of uh, online only cards in there not a lot of those online only cards are there because they the the are uh, the format has fetch lines that's it you can play fetch lines you can play your perfect cards and all of a sudden the busted cards that are not just online are very playable because you can look for your perfect mana you can always determine what you need to get that is timeless and i think timeless kind of proves that i approve some of this wrong by the opinion of like the other dev where tutors are extremely powerful and in magic the gathering you can see that just through the fetch lands. But let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I could be off base, but I think this video was cool. But I think like maybe, you know, that dev is missing some ideas about tutors not being played. No, fetch lands are tutors. That is a great example of how tutors literally define break and mold formats around it in Magic the Gathering.